from the book of Acts, second chapter. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language spoken. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what will we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your son, sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. <clears throat> and so that's the story of Pentecost. You may have noticed that the verses skipped a little bit. Uh, if you want to read the whole encounter, the whole uh, experience on that day, it's all of chapter 2. Uh, but I saved our lay readers today from having to read the names of all the places that people were gathered in Jerusalem from. Uh, but uh, it's a great story. It's a great story of the fulfillment of that promise that Jesus made to us. And it's mentioned in there, it talks about the gift of the Holy Spirit. And what a gift that is. We talk about the gift of Jesus uh, that God gave to us. The gift of his son. And then also the gift of the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised to, to us. There's a, a great preacher from the past, a writer, Dr. Leslie Weatherhead. Uh, he's written a Christian classic called The Will of God. It's still... I think it's still available in print uh, many years. It's just a little thing. But uh, for those of you who are interested in what is the will of God or what does it mean to understand the will of God, uh, I highly recommend his book. He tells a wonderful story about a visit uh, some years ago to, to the place where John Wesley, John Wesley was the founder of Methodism uh, back in the 1700s. And John Wesley, as a part of his, his testimony of who he was, talks about having a, a heartwarming experience at a place called Altersgate. It was Altersgate Chapel in London. Uh, Weatherhead uh, went to visit Altersgate Chapel, and he describes his experience about being there. He said, uh, like on the inside of the pews, or, or on the outside, I guess, down the aisle, uh, some of them had plaques on them. There was one a plaque on one of the pews uh, that read, and it actually had a little light that, that shines on it. It read, on this spot, on May 24th, 1738, John Wesley's heart was strangely warmed. So they still commemorate at Aldersgate Chapel this place where John Wesley had his, as he describes it, heartwarming experience. And uh, Dr. Weatherhead was moved by being in that place. He felt it to be a holy place. He went to the back of the chapel. It was pretty dimly lit. He went to the back of the chapel uh, just to sit back there in the corner and just take it all in, use it as a time for prayer and reflection, just thinking about uh, what had happened there and, and thinking about his own faith. 
And while he's sitting back there, the door of the chapel opened. And an older gentleman walked in. He had this tattered overcoat on. He was using a cane for, to, to, to steady himself. And he didn't see Dr. Weatherhead sitting. The older gentleman felt he was there by himself. He walked down the center aisle, and he got alongside of the, the John Wesley pew there, and he noticed the plaque. He was curious. He walked over. He bent down. He read the words out loud. On this spot, on May 24th, 1738, John Wesley's heart was strangely warmed. And with that, the man immediately fell down on his knees. He looked up and he said, do it again, Lord, do it again. You know, isn't that a great prayer, though? You know, do it again, Lord. Fill, fill my heart with your spirit. Warm, warm our hearts. It's a great prayer. Do it again, Lord. Do it again. Fill me with your spirit. Now, we, we're not exactly sure, just so we're not exactly sure what happened on that first Pentecost. We're not exactly sure what happened to John Wesley at Altersgate. That's some 281 years ago now. Uh, we, we, we probably couldn't even begin to put it into words. That kind of experience is often hard to describe. But we do know this. That heartwarming experience gave John Wesley a new life, a, a, new, a new warmth, a new energy, a new purpose, a new power. And it produced a new church. It, out of that came the, what we know of today as the United Methodist Church. But it started as a movement. John Wesley never wanted to leave the Anglican Church. That was not his intent. He was an Anglican priest. Uh, But his followers realized that there was something new that was happening. And they realized that they would have to start a new movement, if you will. And so that was the beginning of the Methodist Church. Did you know that during his ministry, John Wesley rode more than 25,000 miles on horseback? Did you know that he preached more than 40,000 sermons? that he and his brother Charles, and Charles was the more prolific of the hymn writers, but the two of them, uh, we're told, wrote some 7,000 hymns. Imagine the size of our hymnal if we had all of their, just all of their hymns in there. Did you know that John Wesley developed many cures for diseases? He was, he was concerned about health. He wrote a book on medicine. He started clinics for the poor. Did you know that John Wesley said that churches should be built in an octagonal shape? eight-sided shape, and there should be a rail down the middle of the sanctuary separating the men from the women. John Wesley said a lot of brilliant things, but that's probably not one of the more brilliant ones. Uh, Did you know that at John Wesley's death in 1791, so this is 1791, think about that time period in history. John Wesley was from England, of course. This is just after the Revolutionary War days. We celebrate, we had the Revolutionary War here in 1776. So just following that, his followers numbered 79,000 in England, which is where he was based out of, 40,000 here in America by that time. And by 1957, there were more than 40 million Methodists worldwide. And that today, today, there are millions and millions and millions, and the church continues to grow. Not so much here in our country, but around the world, the United Methodist Church continues to grow. And we pray for that revival even here uh, in our country and in our community and, and, in, our, and in our town right here uh, in Dresher. Did you know, though, that for all the power of his eyes, of his voice, and of his witness for Christ, John Wesley only stood five feet three inches tall and weighed 128 pounds? He was small physically, uh, but he was certainly a giant spiritually. And Why? Because his heart was strangely warmed, because he received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly what happened to the disciples of Jesus at Pentecost. They, they, were, they were powerless, in a sense, before the Holy Spirit came. But when, we, when they received that gift, it warmed their hearts. It set them on fire. And they turned the world upside down. And we see it dramatically in the experiences of Peter. The reason that I chose the verses that I did out of Acts chapter 2 for Becky to read is because we have Peter's sermon to the people that were gathered there. People were wondering what's going on. Something exciting was happening. The wind, the tongues of fire. Uh, it was something different. People thought that the disciples had been drinking already. Peter addresses that. He says, no, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. We're not drunk. Something special is happening. But think about Peter. Think about his life. Over and over again, he, he did the wrong thing. He said the wrong thing at the wrong time. Remember how uh, when Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter's the one who drew his sword and cut off the, the ear of one of the soldiers there. And Jesus, of course, provided a healing and said, that's not the way we're going to handle this. 
remember when Jesus was arrested and he's having his trial and uh, some people are, are talking uh, around a fire. And Peter's there and they say, hey, aren't you, aren't you one of the guys that was with, was with Jesus? Peter says, no, he denies, denies Jesus three times. When Peter tried to, to depend on his own human strength and power, he failed. But when he, when he depended on the strength and the power of God that came upon him at Pentecost, when he received the Holy Spirit, he was able to preach and to be a new person. We see it in the experiences of John Wesley. Relying on his own strength, he, he came to America. I mentioned this uh, not too long ago. John and Charles Wesley uh, came to this country. They came to the area uh, uh, of Georgia, down in Georgia, the area down there. And they were terrible failures. When they went back to England, John Wesley wasn't sure what God had in store, what God had in mind for him. He was already an Anglican priest. But he was hugely disappointed and not, not sure about what God wanted him to do. And it was only then when he had that experience at Aldersgate, when his heart was strangely warmed, when we could say that the Holy Spirit came upon John Wesley, that he began to preach. He was on fire. He told the people about, about the good news of Jesus, and a, and a new movement was started. When he depended on God's strength, good things happened. I think that's a, a great message, a great lesson for all of us. The writer of Acts, we talked last week about how the writer of Acts is actually Luke. Uh, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, and then his second volume is the book of the Acts of the Apostles, probably more appropriately the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And uh, Luke describes the Holy Spirit as a gift. It's a gift. The Holy Spirit is a gift. And it's a, it's a gift from God that can turn lives around. It's a, it's a gift from God that can turn our weaknesses into strength. It can, turns our, can turn our defeats into victories. And, and I want to share just a couple of thoughts about what that means. First of all, I think the Holy Spirit redeems situations. The Holy Spirit redeems, saves situations. The Holy Spirit can take something bad, a bad scene, and, and convert it into something good, something useful. If we do the best we can... God will do the rest. God will do the rest. That's what happened at Pentecost. Simon Peter did his best, and he allowed God to finish it. And we're told at the end of that passage uh, that was read this morning in verse 41 that 3,000 people, 3,000 people became followers of Jesus on that day. God doesn't ask us to be successful. God just asks us to be, to be faithful, to try to do his will, to do the best we can at doing God's will, and that God will take take us and and do the rest and and do it for good. The Spirit of God can take a weak voice and make it sound like a trumpet, can take defeat and turn it into victory. That's That's the first thing I think we need to see. The Holy Spirit can redeem situations, can redeem us. Secondly, the Holy Spirit reminds us of the truth. Throughout the Bible, the Holy Spirit is the truth giver, the truth giver. The Holy Spirit comes to reveal God's truth to us. Dr. Fred Craddock uh, was a pastor and then became a, a professor and a great teacher of preachers, really. He was a tremendous preacher. But he tells a story about something that happened to him in his early days of his ministry. He was helping with Vacation Bible School. We talk a lot about Vacation Bible School, and it's coming up next month. Well, he was helping in Vacation Bible School. He said, uh, at that time, and I remember these days, he said, it used to last for two weeks. But there were so many casualties among the teachers that we reduced it to one week. Any of you remember the, the, the days of two-week-long Bible schools? I remember they used to have the curriculum for whole two weeks, ten days. Well, Dr. Craddock said that he had this group of young children that were just driving him crazy. Especially, uh, there was one little boy. And, and this was at the time when they had it two weeks. So by the end of that, that second week, it was especially bad. And Dr. Craddock described this difficult boy like this. He said, this was this one boy. There was this one boy in the class who, well, let me put it like this. Have you ever had somebody in class that was so bad you were glad when they were absent? He was that type. And quite honestly, I had written him off. He's not paying attention, I thought. He doesn't care. He doesn't want to be here. He's not interested in the lessons. He's only interested in seeing how crazy he can drive me and in disrupting the class. He's hopeless. Dr. Craddock had had given up on this little boy. 
He has said he'd gotten so worn out with it that he was now simply trying to think of things for the students to do that would keep them busy and keep them out of his hair. And he came up with this idea. He said uh, he decided to let them go outside and do a study of creation. So he got them all together at the door. He said, now listen, when I ring the bell, I want you all to scatter and go outside, find one of God's miracles, and then when I ring it again, come back and show us what you have and tell us what it teaches us about God. Craddock rang the bell. The students scattered. He said his plan was not to ring it again, (laughs) but he did. Uh, After a while, he rang the bell. The students came back with God's miracles. Well, what do you have, Dr. Craddock asked. One little boy had a rock. He said, this rock reminds us that God is strong and made the world. One little girl had a flower. She said, only God can make a flower like this. It's so pretty. Another little girl had a leaf that had fallen off a tree and had turned brown. She said, God made the seasons of the year, summer, fall, winter, spring. Another boy stepped forward with some huckleberries. He said, God provides for us. He feeds the animals and he feeds us. Well, that's great, said Dr. Craddock. Then he looked over. He saw that little boy that was a challenge for him standing off on the side. He didn't have anything in his hands. He was actually just standing there holding the hand of his little sister who had been in her own kindergarten classroom. Craddock thought, what is he doing? Why won't he cooperate? I guess they're going to leave early. Why didn't someone tell me? And then this conversation took place. Leaving early? Dr. Craddock asked the boy. No, sir. Well, did you bring anything? Yes, sir. What did you bring? My little sister. Your little sister... Yes, sir. Why did you do that? Because she's God's miracle. I prayed for a little sister, and God gave me one. She's the best miracle I know of. Fred Craddock said he just stood there. He was stunned because he knew that that little boy was right, and he knew that God was there in that room in that moment. Craddock said, I don't know whatever happened to that boy, but I hope he's still doing that. He was the only one in the class, including the teacher, who got the point. The Holy Spirit touched that little boy's heart when no one was looking and gave him the truth. The truth that God's God's greatest miracles are people. You want to see one of God's miracles? I'll get my sister. I'll get my sister. And that really is one of the great truths of the Bible. We, we, you you and me, were made in the image of God. Talk about a miracle. You know, God made the squirrels and the elephants and the giraffes, and God made the trees and the flowers and the rocks and the skies and all of those things. God made all of it. He said, that's good. That's good. But to cap it off, cap it off, God said, now for the masterpiece. I'm going to create something like myself. And God made you. God made you. And sometimes I think it's a sin for us to say, oh, I'm only human. You know, we're created in the image of God. If you want to see one of God's miracles, you don't have to get a rock or a leaf or a flower. Those things are fine. All you have to do is look around. Look around. Look at the people next to you. Those are God's miracles. That's the power of God's creation. And sometimes when we least expect it, the Holy Spirit reveals the truth. That's what happened in that vacation Bible school classroom that that week, that day. And and there's another lesson, I think, in that, and that is don't write anybody off. Don't give up on anybody. And especially don't write off the Holy Spirit. That's what Pentecost teaches us. The Holy Spirit redeems situations. The Holy Spirit reminds us of the truth. And finally, and I think we should never forget this, the Holy Spirit restores our strength. Restores our strength. Simon Peter, down, out, defeated, embarrassed. He had failed. He had denied his master at a very critical time. He had seen the crucifixion. He was devastated. He had met the resurrected Christ, but still felt like a failure. He felt inadequate for the task. But then came, then came the Holy Spirit. Then came the Holy Spirit, and Simon Peter's life was changed. He was transformed into a new into a new person. And the, the Spirit gave him the power to become a man of courage, 
to become a man who was willing to talk about Jesus and to share his love of Jesus with others. The Holy Spirit restores our strength. Not long ago, I was visiting with one of our members who was going through a tough time. I went there to try to be a pastor and to minister, and and she ministered to me. She said, don't worry about me. I'm going to make it. I'm going to be okay. I just take it one day at a time. I, I know that God is with me. God will give me the strength that I need to get through. Of course, I've had, heard that many times before, and it's true, isn't it? That's the good news of our faith. God never, God never deserts us. He never leaves us. God gives us strength. He redeems situations. Reminds us of the truth. A young man approached his girlfriend's father to ask to marry the man's daughter. The father was skeptical. He said, you, you don't know what you're asking. She's, she has very extravagant tastes. I doubt very much that you'll ever be able to support my daughter. I'm a wealthy man, and I, I, can, I can barely manage it myself. The young man thought for a moment, and then he said, Sir, I think I have the answer. You and I could just pool our resources. That's the message of the Christian faith, isn't it? We're not alone. God is with us. We can pull our resources with God, and God's strength will see us through. God's strength will carry us. God's strength will give us the power we need, the truth that we need, uh, to be able to save the world. That's what he's calling us to do. And so the lesson is this. With God's help, with God's grace, with God's strength, with God's Holy Spirit, we need to do our best now. And trust in God for tomorrow. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you so much for uh, this day. This day that we come, we remember, we celebrate uh, the gift of your Holy Spirit. And we pray that we would grow stronger in our faith each and every day. We would feel your Spirit working in our lives, working in our church, working in our community. Lord, uh, we know that you give us the power to change. You give us new life new hope. You transform us into the people that you call us to be. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would help us share the good news of your love with with our world. Help us to be a blessing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.